Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for that warm welcome. The uh, presentation I'm going to give tonight is going to take you on a mental and visual journey of survival. And much, much of what I learned came from one incident that happened in 1980 when two boats from Cape Cod went out to George's Bank. These are commercial fishermen. And of the eight men that went out, only four came back. And I spent an awful lot of time with those four men interviewing them for the book Fatal Forecast. And then I interviewed dozens of other peoples for different projects. And in the course of the interviews, I began to notice that the survivors had common mindsets and techniques. In other words, one person might have used one approach and then I'd interview another person and they'd have a very similar approach. So that after a while, I began to think, you know, I wonder how these would relate to daily life when we're faced with a really difficult challenge. Now, one of the men on the fair wind is Ernie Hazard. Ernie was 33 years old. And throughout the evening, you're going to hear me refer to Ernie quite a bit. Now, this is a school librarian <laughs> after a tough day. <laughs> I, I put this in to, uh, to show how hard this type of uh, commercial fishing work is. You know, they fall asleep in any old place because when they get on the fishing grounds, they might work for 18 hours straight uh, because it costs so much in fuel to get out to George's Bank. But sometimes that's the best thing to do is cut your losses and go in a new direction. And good decision makers like to test the waters first whenever possible. And they also ask themselves, could there be more options? Maybe there's an option staring me in the face. And that's what happened with Peter Brown on the sea fever when that 100-foot wave hit. He tried a couple things. He had tried going into the seas, and that's when he lost the windshields. Then he turned the boat and was going with the seas, and they were breaking on the stern and uh, causing incredible damage to the boat. And so the guys, his crew members, are saying, what? There's nothing left to do. And Peter said, yeah, there is. We're just going to let the boat be a boat. He said, I'm going to put it in neutral. I'm going to get off the wheel. And the boat on its own would ride up these waves sideways and then come down off them sideways, which is terrifying, but it saved their lives. Bad decision makers. and. And be honest here, how many people have said this to themselves? I've come this far, I might as well. <laughs> or to this next one, I've invested so much of myself in this, I'm going to keep going. And we all do it, I know I've done it, but it, it traps you. And you want to stop and think, should I continue on this path? And I can't tell you how many mountaineers I've interviewed who had this very mindset. They were so close to the summit, they could taste it. And all the information, though, that's coming back, whether, uh, whether night's closing then on, on them or not, is telling them, you're not going to make it to the summit safely, turn back. And yet, they've invested so much time and planning into it, they ignore those signals that are coming in and push on to the summit. And that's invariably how they get in trouble. So when in, you know, when in doubt, uh, remember this little saying, if you hear your, your inner self saying, I've come this far, might as well, you don't necessarily have to keep going. And then the dribble into corners, that's just something that goes back to my coaching days. I coached fifth and sixth graders in <laughs> basketball for years. And they would come in new and excited. And the easiest way to get to the opposing basket would be to go straight down the sideline and the other team would funnel them right into a corner. So now the kid with the ball is trapped in the corner with the opposing team around him. You know, he's got no options. And it, it was so hard to break him of that habit. I said, bring it up the middle and then pause and think. You've got three options. You can dribble left, you can dribble right, or you can pass. You're not trapped in the corner. It's a little harder going up the middle, but you're going to have your options. Kids do teach you things. I asked Ernie, I said, you had to be worried about sharks because they're attracted to structure and life raft is a structure. 
And Ernie just laughed at me. And I said, why are you laughing? And he goes, Mike, that's the last thing on my mind. I said, you had to know there were sharks under your raft. He said, oh, I, I figured there were. He said, but I had absolutely no control over that. He said, I was focused on the few things I had some degree of control over. And he would th mention things like bailing uh, the raft out, patching holes in it, experimenting with different sitting positions so he wouldn't get tossed out of the doorway. Adrenaline and emotion, boy, they, you know, people think they're the best things in the world, but sometimes they can do you big harm. Has anybody ever been lost in the woods? I, I have, and you're, I see a few hands going up, and it's terrifying, and the feeling you get is you want to run to escape being lost before night closes in. And it, it takes willpower to just sit down and think the situation through. <laughs> And the advice I would offer is almost look at yourself uh, from a distance. Stand back as if you're looking down on yourself, sitting on the floor of the woods and going, what would a wise person do in this situation? Rather than just reacting to that adrenaline shooting through you that's screaming, do something, do something. And the only thing you can do is run. So it, it fosters quick decisions. And then to offset the adrenaline, shift to neutral. Resisting emotion, now here, here's one. <laughs> boy, boy, this had a chord. The emails, and, and I know this from personal experience as well, and I, I'm sure you'll know just what I mean. You get a, an email that you perceive is either nasty or condescending, and your inclination is to fire right back. Don't do it. Pause, and if you can, wait till the next day. And then what's going to happen is you're going to reread that email and the whole tone of the email may strike you a little differently. Just because you waited, you let that emotion get out of the situation. And one time in my case when I finally took my own advice and waited a day, I reread the email and I said, you know what? This isn't nasty or condescending at all. I don't even know how I got that yesterday. And so I was able to respond in a, a measured way. And the best advice I can give is if you get an email like that, don't email back at all. Pick up the phone. Words in email, an email can be misconstrued. I, one of the books I did uh, and, and I'm still working with is with a co-author. And one of the survivors who was assigned to the co-author finally called me and he goes, Mike, I won't work with him anymore. And I'm like, why? He's, he's a very good author. He goes, you know why? All he does is send me emails. He's never picked up the phone and called me like you do. And that's the advice I would give to you because emails can be misconstrued. And this survivor felt like, well, he was almost like being used. The person never took the time to pick up the phone and ask, how are you doing? Am I asking too many questions? Is this difficult for you to relive this? Historic examples, boy, imagine if Kennedy caved in to all the generals, you know, crying to bomb Cuba. Or if Washington in the siege of Boston, all his generals and advisors were saying, take Boston, the British are trapped there. And Washington was patient. He waited till he got the guns from Ticonderoga. And the British <coughs> left on their own. He didn't lose a man. He was able to get his objective without losing a single person. <laughs> 